Reformation is the Roman Catholic view. There are a few other groups that have either that view or something that's so near neighbor to it that I can't figure out what the difference is. Uh, you understand that they believe that the bread and the wine uh, is actually changed into literal body and literal blood. Uh, now, they don't believe that it changes appearance or taste, obviously, but they do believe that, it, that it's a literal, and they, that basically you say, well, how do they believe? They hide in mystery. You know, it's a mystery. We can't figure it out. So they kind of hide in the mystery. The objections to this is Jesus is standing before them in the flesh and he holds this up and says, this is my body. I mean, the, the illogic of that reality on its very, it's a prima facie argument against that view. But secondly, Scripture still speaks of it as bread after he has said this in 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 11. So contrary to reason and common sense as well, you can't be in two places at once. Um, and it doesn't look and taste like flesh. And probably most importantly, the, the mass, as it's called, in the Roman Catholic Church with this view of transubstantiation, would involve a kind of re-sacrificing of Christ that denies the infinite value of Christ once for all sacrifice. And Hebrews 6 verse 6 has some pretty stern words to say about that about crucifying the Son of God all over again and putting Him to public disgrace. Um, so, um, instead of pointing to Christ, this view elevates the elements. It points to the elements themselves. And instead of leading to worship, it, it, instead of leading to worship Christ, it leads to worshiping the elements. And that's why you see them, in, they go in these elaborate processions and holding the elements up like this, and they go through this elaborate process to get to the place where that moment that it's supposed to, he says, hoc es corpus meum, this is my body, bang, the magic. By the way, that's where we get the phrase hocus pocus, did you know that? Yeah, that's where it came from. Kind of yeah. terrible to think about that, but that's uh, blasphemous almost, but that's where it comes from. That, that in that moment, hope as corpus meum, this is my body, that's when... And so it, it leads to idolatry, and it short-circuits faith, But because a person can get Christ simply by eating. I mean, all you got to do is be able to swallow. And you can get Jesus. And so it reduces it to the absurd. Now the view, I'm going to present it to you, but man, I still can't figure it out. The Lutheran view is consubstantiation, and uh, this is the view that Christ's body and blood is present in, with, and under the elements. So that when Jesus held the bread, he also held his body. And again, the objections are similar because everyone who receives the elements then receives Christ, even if they're unbelievers, if it's with, by, and under. And then secondly, it destroys the human nature of Christ, making his body omnipresent. And Jesus actually taught his physical absence. <laughs> In John 16, verses 7 and 28, he said this, It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. I came from the Father, I entered the world, and I'm leaving the world, and I'm going back to the Father. Can anything be any clearer? You know, um, the body of Jesus is in heaven, seated on the throne of God, sometimes described as at the right hand of God, uh, and he is coming again with great power and glory, but he doesn't make these kind of, uh, you know, sneak appearances through this magical thing in, in the sacrament. Now, the extreme view to those two is the Zwinglian view. Uh, Ulrich Zwingli was um, a Swiss reformer, uh, and he had this view that uh, is called the memorial, memorial view. Baptists and others have this view that it's merely a sign or a symbol of the absent Christ that it's merely a memorial of his death in the past and an act of Christian profession now. 
so that partakers receive bread and wine only, quote, in remembrance. So the emphasis is on the in remembrance of me. So we would call this, instead of real presence, this could be called the real absence. <laughs> uh, the objection to this, though, is it seems like that the sacrament had some kind of referential force and value uh, beyond that, because in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul warns that those that had uh, wrongly partaken became sick, and some of them even died from their irreverent partaking of the meal. It seems our view uh, is the, the mediating view of really all of that, and that is uh, the view that Christ is spiritually present in the sacrament. This is the Reformed or the Calvinistic view. So, as the elements are present to the outward senses, Christ's body and blood are really present spiritually by faith. Um, Robert Latham says this in uh, his work on the Lord's Supper. Just as we need a mouth to receive bread and wine, so we need faith to receive Christ. I thought that was a beautiful way to describe it. Uh, so we spiritually feed upon Christ in the heart through the instrumentality of these physical and representative objects. The virtues and effects of his sacrifice are actually conveyed by the power of the Holy Spirit, a kind of dynamic happening in the present which communicates the effects of the past sacrifice. So our union and communion with Christ are not essentially different from what the disciples enjoyed that first night. So what, what we're saying in this view is that this is the closest that a, this is my best summary of trying to put it into vernacular that people can understand. This view of the presence of Christ is this. The closest that we can come to actually seeing and touching Christ this side of heaven is this sacrament. The closest that we can come to actually seeing and touching Christ this side of heaven And Horatius Boner's great hymn captures this. Here, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Not literally, but spiritually. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. Not literally, but spiritually. Here would I grasp with firmer hand eternal grace and all my weariness upon thee lean. Beautiful words. That's from Horatius Boner's uh, great communion hymn. <clears throat> now, the larger uh, catechism, question number 170, I think really uh, sums a lot of this up. How do we worthily, um, how do they that worthily communicate in the Lord's Supper, that means receive, worthily receive in the Lord's Supper, feed upon the body and blood of Christ. As the body and blood of Christ are not corporal and carnal, that is, physical, not corporally or carnally present in, with, or under the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper, and yet are spiritually present to the faith of the receiver, no less truly and really than the elements themselves are to their outward senses, so they that worthily communicate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper do therein feed upon the body and blood of Christ, not after a corporal and carnal manner, but in a spiritual manner, yet truly and really, while by faith they receive and apply unto themselves Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death. So what he's saying is, as literally palpably, tangibly, touchably, smellably, tasteably real as the bread and the wine are, the benefits that we receive when we receive them by faith are just as real as that. There's a tendency for us to think that spiritual things are not really real. There are things that are kind of out there, they're in the mist and you know, you can't really grab hold of them. You can't really 
understand them or relate to them or enjoy them except in some kind of vague and mystical and sort of a dreamy, mysterious way. But the, the purpose of the sacrament is that God is saying to us, every time we partake of it, I am this real. As real as all of this is to your senses, that's how real I am to you now. I am for you now. And all that's depicted here, my broken body, my poured out blood, uh, in this sacrament, is designed to reinforce all of that. Does that make sense? And this is what we need to help our people to get a, a, a greater appreciation for sensitivity to and enjoyment of. All right, so who may be admitted, um, who may partake of the Lord's Supper? Professing believers in good standing in an evangelical church who have examined and prepared themselves and those who see their sin and their desire to come to Christ in faith. We call that fencing the table. You've heard that language. Uh, fencing the table is when we pretty much say that. It comes from the warning in 1 Corinthians 11, as you know. Um, and um, But we never restrict admission to our table based on membership in our church. But a person does need to be a member in a gospel preaching, teaching church. But those, so those who profess uh, and those who see their sin and desire to come to Christ in faith. Now those who may not be admitted are unbelievers because then they would drink judgment on themselves as 1 Corinthians 11 says. Or believers in an unrepentant state. Uh, this, one, by the way, one thing about regular uh, enjoyment of the sacrament is it really forces the issue on regular repentance. <laughs> Unless you want to get sick and die! <laughs> uh, and then, children of believers are not yet able to discern the body of the Lord unless, of course, they have also made a credible profession of faith in Christ and become communion members. So, um, because uh, unlike the, in the case of the initiatory sacrament into the covenant community, the participatory sacrament of the community is connected with the capacity of the recipient to discern the body and blood of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 11. You don't ever see that kind of statement made with regard to uh, baptism and circumcision, but you certainly do with regard to the Lord's Supper. So how do we do that? How do we examine or prepare ourselves uh, before the table? And larger catechism, question 171. By the way, I commend to you that whole section that goes actually from larger catechism 170 through 177, I think, uh, is a fantastic section. But 171 says, through prayer and meditation, we must examine ourselves of being in Christ, being truly a Christian, of our sins and shortcomings, of the truth and measure of our knowledge of Christ's death, of genuine faith and repentance, of love to God and others, charity and forgiveness, not harboring any bitterness, resentment, or unforgiveness toward another, and a desire to follow Christ with renewed obedience. You can see how this kind of built-in sacrament of self-examination can be all by itself in that kind of preparatory feature, a huge uh, strengthening of, uh, of our spiritual vibrancy and progress in faith. Uh, and that's before we ever even receive the sacrament, but it is the, um, the, uh, the appropriate process of preparation to receive the sacrament. Well, there you have it, the sacraments. And can you believe it? We finished in time. Wonders never <laughs> seen. That's the first time you've ever been ahead of schedule, man. Now he, One other time. One other time. I, I wasn't here that day. It's pretty rare. <laughs> it was while you were in Canada. See, you're the... I thought you were the one that was slowing me down. But here you are tonight, and we're doing fine. 
<laughs> Brothers, um, let's close with a word of prayer and, and let you go. Lord, how thankful we are as we began this looking at, at old Calvin's statement that we are, we're ignorant and dull, witted, spiritually and weak, and we need all kinds of props for our faith. And what wonderful things you've provided us in these pictures and promises displayed for us in the sacrament. And uh, these, the declaration of all that we have in the gospel from eternity past to eternity future is laid out here for us. All that you purposed in, in conceiving our salvation and, and then certifying it through the work of Christ and commencing our salvation and its application to us individually and that consummation of it yet awaiting us in the new heavens and the new earth. All of it you have stamped with the certitude of your commitment to bind yourself to us in this everlasting covenant of grace that nothing in heaven, on earth, or under the earth can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you. Amen.